now I'd like to introduce Dr. Marty Leonard, President of KEGS and Dean of Graduate Studies at Dalhousie University. Thanks very much, Ian. Well, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are in the country. It's a pleasure to welcome you uh, to today's plenary, which is entitled Degrees of Success, Exploring the Challenges and Lived Experiences of Students and Recent Graduates and Their Entries into the Workforce. This plenary is being hosted by the Council of Canadian Academies, who've recently released a report from an expert panel on the labor market transition of PhD graduates. And we have the privilege of hearing firsthand from Dr. Elizabeth Cannon, the chair of the expert panel and our plenary speaker today about this important and to of the CAGS audience in particular, very relevant topic. So I would now like to introduce Dr. Eric Meslin, President and CEO of the Council of Canadian Academies to say a few words and to introduce Dr. Cannon. Over to you, Eric. Thanks very much, Marty. And thanks for the warm greeting. And thanks also to the Canadian Association of Graduate Studies for partnering with us to help bring our assessment to a, a wider audience, uh, something that we always hope our work uh, does. If you can put up the next slide, I'll just give you a quick overview of, of what the CCA is and, and how it does its work. We've been around since 2005 doing one thing, carrying out assessments of the evidence on important public policy topics, usually requested by the government of Canada. We've done it on a diversity of issues from uh, medical care to energy. Uh, we're an organization that, as I say, does one thing. We begin all of our work with a, a question um, we uh, carry out that question by bringing in uh, top experts, usually and hopefully the best minds from around the world and sometimes uh, people that you will know very well from your own organization. Uh, the evidence is assessed, it goes through an extensive peer review uh, process, and then by the end of it we can produce it in both languages, English and French, free of charge uh, on our uh, website. Every assessment begins, however, with a question. And if we can get the next slide. In this case, the question was referred to us by uh, the Minister of uh, Innovation, Science and Economic Development with other support from uh, NSERC, SHRC, uh, and Employment and Social Development Canada. Here's what the panel was asked to answer. We call it the charge. What are the main challenges that PhD students in Canada face in transitioning to the labor market? And how do these differ by field of study? There were three sub questions that the panel was asked to address. What unique challenges do PhD graduates working in Canada face in launching their careers within academia? What unique challenges do PhD graduates working in Canada face in launching their careers outside academia? And finally, what are the key motivations behind the migration of PhD graduates in and out of Canada? Is brain circulation simply a feature of a highly globalized knowledge-based economy, or is it caused by a lack of opportunities for PhD graduates? So that's what the panel was asked to address. Who was the panel? Next slide, please. The expert panel on labor market transition of PhD graduates uh, was collected from a number of expert areas of knowledge and experience. The 12 scholars and practitioners brought their knowledge of labor economics, psychology, education, sociology, university administration, and professional development, as well as the industrial sector. It included several recent PhD graduates, Tina Grosso, Brian Gopal, and Jennifer Polk in particular, who were able to speak to contemporary experiences in transitioning to the labor market following their graduation. Brian Gopal also brought a valuable perspective on the international mobility of PhD graduates. He obtained his PhD in Canada, but now works as an assistant professor at the University of Rochester uh, in the US. Another member, uh, Marceline Bangali, is an associate professor at the Université Laval and was able to bring a francophone perspective as well as evidence of the PhD graduates in French 
uh, Quebec uh, universities. A great group, one that the CCA is proud of uh, having supported and endorsed. Uh, before though I pass our microphone to the featured speaker, I just wanted to make a couple of final reminder comments about the Q&A process, which we're very excited about. Please remember to put your questions in the Q&A bar as you think of them, rather than waiting until the end of the session. Uh, our team will be collecting them and identifying uh, the ones that we hope we can answer. We'll have lots of time for discussion, but we may not get to all the questions. Uh, we won't prompt, we can't answer every single one, but we'll, we'll do our best. It will really depend on what you want to know and, and what we can answer. I hope you can appreciate that uh, the more questions, the better, but we may just not be able to get to them today. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, the panel chair, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Cannon, who is well known to, I'm sure, many of you um, associated with CAGS, Emerita President of the University of Calgary, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering, a scholar in innovation and, and policy, and one that the CCA was just delighted to have lead this expert panel. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Elizabeth, with our thanks very much for offering findings and reflections on the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored to uh, present the findings and reflections on behalf of the expert panel. I know many of our panel members are part of the audience today, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, thank you to CAGS for hosting us and for the support from the CCA. Uh, it was a fantastic uh, process. Uh, I'm, we're very proud of the report and uh, delighted to be able to bring uh, some of the findings uh, to you today. Um, next slide, please. Um, I wanted to start by laying down the context uh, of, of which we are immersed in, in, uh, in terms of graduate education and PhD uh, education, particularly in Canada. And really it starts from the point of view that uh, PhD graduates bring valued skills and knowledge to a wide range of sectors in our country. We know that PhDs think creatively, they solve problems, they're very important to innovation and to developing and maintaining competitiveness, particularly as Canada moves to uh, more knowledge intensive industries. This is a long-standing policy priority for our country and of course many other countries as well. However, within that context, we know that many PhDs face significant challenges entering the labor market following graduation. And we're going to see some data uh, on this uh, in terms of where they go and uh, some of the other factors that frankly contribute to an underutilization of PhDs uh, in the workforce. This has given rise to very important questions for both students and Canadian society about the value of PhD training and its investment and how to optimize students' education experiences to ensure that their contributions can be best realized to Canadian economy and society. We wanted to, as a panel, take a deep dive into the specific challenges facing Canada's PhD graduates as they transition from the university to the work environment. And, uh, the report does not contain recommendations. That is not part of the CCA process per se, but uh, we have a number of findings, re reflections, and we do hope this report sparks conversation, which is exactly uh, the uh, environment and platform that we have today uh, through CAGS. Um, this is important, and we do hope uh, within the graduate education community, universities more broadly, government industry, um, that the people take this report and see what can be done uh, to push uh, this forward. I will make a note as well that uh, when the panel undertook its work, which started in May 2019, uh, we did not um, look at uh, things like COVID. Uh, so that uh, was not considered, uh, obviously had not arrived yet. And so some of that um, is not, it is not included in the report as you see uh, presented. So uh, at the end of the uh, report, uh, we hope that you'll find it's very rigorous. 
Uh, we're very proud of the work that has been done to frame this and some of the research and original research uh, that is contained as well. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of the structure of the report, uh, it is based on uh, meetings held by the panels. I mentioned started in May 2019. We met five times, four in person, one virtually over each of those two days. Um, we had uh, several pieces of original research that were done. We commissioned analysis uh, from Ross Finney on the education and labor market longitudinal platform, looking at trajectory of earnings of new PhDs over the first five years. We also carried out original analysis uh, looking at census data to determine the return of a PhD relative to a master's program, and I'll touch on that later. We also, of course, had the benefit of peer review. Uh, again, thank you to uh, the 10 experts that provided excellent feedback on drafts, which were considered in the final report. And we also, of course, in our work had uh, looked at uh, uh, research, uh, gray literature, so to speak, from a wide range of stakeholders, um, uh, looking at surveys that had been done at various institutions, and of course, uh, some of the new information that we brought to the table. We didn't want to just bring quantitative information that is very important, uh, but it was extremely critical to the panel that we shine a light on the lived experience of students and recent graduates. Um, the most interesting thing about this report is uh, for those of us who have PhDs, we all have our own story and we wanted to capture those and you'll see um, interspersed in the report about 11 um, stories of, of PhD graduates, some who have been challenged and struggled and, and, and done well, um, others who are still finding their way. But we wanted to capture that because I think it, it speaks to the complexity of the issue and not boiling down just to numbers. In chapter two, uh, we talk about the background and context of PhD education in Canada, the number of degrees um, and funding in institutions. Chapter three looks at current experiences and perceptions of PhD students graduates and postdoctoral fellows, uh, including academic culture. Chapter four then starts to look at receptor capacity, looking at various sectors, higher education, private sector, and so on. Um, also, whether PhDs are graduating with the skills and experience that are sought by hiring managers, particularly outside um, the academic environment. Chapter five uh, looks at the labor market outcomes of PhDs once they enter the workforce. So this is where we have a discussion of unemployment rates and salaries, um, looking at the economic returns of uh, pursuing a PhD and whether the outcomes and earnings for PhDs are different for recent graduates in comparison to other cohorts. Chapter six uh, tackles uh, part of the charge dealing with the global movement of PhDs from Canada and including reasons why Canadian PhDs choose to stay or leave the country. Chapter seven is really uh, looking forward. Uh, it is uh, capturing some of the leading practices that are already being put into place today. Um, some of them that are done here in Canada, some of them internationally. And, and really trying to shine a light in, in four areas that I will talk about um, that are really, I think, providing uh, some level of momentum going forward to, to tackle this issue. And I'll, I'll wind up by talking uh, about some brief uh, reflections of the panel um, at the end of the report. Next slide, please. So in terms of main findings, uh, next slide, please. I uh, wanted to start with looking at PhD graduates in Canada and how that has evolved over time. And we have seen uh, in this country and certainly other countries that uh, there have been significant efforts to increase our supply of highly qualified personnel and investments in research in our universities. This has been done for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is, was an expected impending shortage of, of PhD graduates to supply the academic market. As faculty retired, we would need that next generation to come in and to fill uh, those positions uh, within our institutions. Secondly, uh, was to provide industry with a workforce of innovators that would address uh, Canada's productivity gap compared to competing jurisdictions, so tied to things like innovation and productivity. 
And thirdly, to supply researchers uh, to work on university research projects. If you look at the increased investment within universities in research, uh, PhD graduates are obviously very critical as part of those research teams uh, to be able to contribute to the research enterprise. The challenge uh, with the growth of PhD uh, graduates in Canada is that there are simply not enough tenure track positions uh, within the academy, and I'll show you some data shortly, uh, but also outside of the academy, because what you would like to see as the numbers increase in PhD graduate production, that the receptor capacity is also balanced to be able to absorb those graduates. Next slide, please. This shows the number of PhD uh, graduates over time starting in 2002. It's the number of uh, PhDs awarded per 10,000 of uh, working age uh, Canadians. And what you see is an increase uh, just in terms of absolute numbers in 2002, there were just over 3,700. By 2010, 6,000 and by 2017, 8,000. Uh, in fact, the number of PhD graduates per year has grown faster than the working age population in Canada and also is higher than the growth rate for bachelor's degrees, almost double over the same time frame. Um, however, just uh, to put that into perspective, Canada still uh, really ranks low relative to our OECD peers in PhD graduates. Um, if we just compare to Australia, we have this in the report, we would have to double our number of PhD graduates to compare to where Australia is today. So uh, yes, there's been a big increase, but we are still lagging relative to peer countries. Next slide, please. I think the interesting aspect is how has that growth in PhD uh, graduate production uh, balanced with the opportunities within the academic community? And this shows the number of uh, open tenure track positions. So the number of tenure track positions in Canada over approximately the same time frame. The top dotted line shows the total number of tenure track positions. And you can see it increased but leveled out about 2008 or nine and sits at between 40 and 41,000 tenure track. Below uh, the three colored lines show the rank of those faculty positions. And the one I want to focus on is the red. That is assistant professor, which is the entry level for most academic positions. You can see it increased, but had a point of inflection around 2008 or 9, uh, and really has declined since that time. So yes, they more were brought into the system, but as they were promoted to associate and associated to full, um, there were not uh, an increasing number of open uh, assistant level positions for the increased number of PhD graduates. Um, this is important because it shows that the, there is a compression in opportunities for tenure track positions for our graduates. I should also say, and we know this within the academic sector, when we go out to hire for academic appointments, it is a global search in most cases. So it's not that only PhD graduates from Canada get open tenure track positions in this country as well. You are competing in a global enterprise. So uh, this uh, is an important finding, I think, in terms of opportunities uh, within the academic sector in tenure track. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of where academic uh, PhD graduates go, about 50% stay in higher education, about 25% in tenure track, 25% in other areas. It may be postdocs, it may be sessionals, it may be in administrative positions within our academic institutions. This is a quote particularly from a, a, a postdoctoral fellow. It says, it's a lonely academic experience, more so than the PhD, no cohort, no association in no man's land between faculty and students. Many PhD graduates go to a postdoc, it's expected in some disciplines to um, be able to take on a future academic appointment, but the data shows that's not necessarily the case. And whether it's postdocs, whether it's sessional lecturers uh, who are teaching more uh, frequently undergraduate courses, this creates a precarious um, employment situation and, and not feeling part of perhaps uh, the university community as a whole. So in some case, we see the uh, PhD graduates 
uh, entering this uh, precarious work environment, short cycles of employment, not necessarily leading to uh, full-time employment, particularly within academic institutions. Next slide, please. So what about outside uh, the academic environment? And what we have seen is that non-academic sectors have not significantly increased their uptake of PhD graduates. So we looked at data from several university specific surveys, U of A, UBC, U of T McGill, uh, the ELM uh, LP data that I talked about earlier. And, and sort of put that data together. We couldn't compare uh, apples to apples in all cases. But looking at that, we see about 20 to 25% of PhD graduates do end up in the private sector. And the rest you can see from the chart are in public, self-employed or not for profits. So um, what is part of the challenge here particularly is on the private sector side. And if we go to the next slide, please, um, I'll show a slide that's probably familiar to many of you. It is, and, and we used it as a proxy for industrial activity and uptake receptor capacity for PhD graduates. And it's the gross expenditure in R&D as a percentage of GDP. And you see three lines here. Um, the blue in the middle is the average percentage for the OECD. The yellow is the United States and the red in the bottom is Canada. And what you can see quite markedly is that in Canada, not only did we have a relatively low GERD as a percentage of GDP in 2008, it has actually declined. So we're sitting um, at about 1.6% in, 1 1 in 2018, relative to say the United States, which is about 2.8%. So what this says is that Canadian um, expenditures in R&D are declining. And that obviously is not good news for PhD graduates who would hope to go out and to be able to contribute into uh, knowledge intensive industries. What we see also, which is somewhat unique to Canada is where is the R&D being conducted? We know in Canada over 50% of the R&D expenditures incur, occur in business, while the overall OECD average is about 70%. What that means is that for Canada, we are more heavily weighted to doing R&D within our academic institutions. Industry is at a lower level relative to other jurisdictions. So that again becomes a dynamic of their receptor capacity. They are doing, we are investing less and industry is performing a lower percentage relative to um, uh, industry and other jurisdictions. So this again presents challenges as a receptor capacity for our PhD graduates. Next slide, please. In terms of the labor market outcomes of PhDs, it varies significantly by gender and discipline. And we know that the economic return of a PhD based on the data is lower for younger graduates compared to PhDs in general. We found unemployment rates among women with PhDs are higher than men across most disciplines, um, while women's earnings are always lower, probably in part because they more are employed in part-time positions. For uh, PhDs working full time, the gap between men and women is narrowing. So that's a good news. However, women are always uh, virtually always less than men for all. We also see that the gap between the highest and lowest incomes grows during the first five years. Um, and we see that younger PhDs have similar or higher unemployment levels than those with bachelor's or master's degrees. Next slide, please. This shows the earnings growth after completing a PhD for the 2010 cohort, and it's uh, split out by discipline. And you can see at the top, uh, well, number one, you can see there is a huge variation across disciplines. At the top are um, PhDs in business. So um, start off much higher than other disciplines and uh, escalates up from there. Uh, next, you see a number of, I would call sort of STEM-based disciplines that are lumped together, things like engineering, mathematics, and computer science, health and education, all of whom have similar earnings. At the bottom, you see PhDs in humanities and sciences, 
um, probably because they're working in more transitional roles and a lower probability of becoming uh, a tenure track faculty member. Um, the differences, as I mentioned, are huge. Uh, PhDs in business earning over 80% more than graduates in humanities and sciences after five years. And also for the most part, PhD graduates earn more than master's graduates in the same discipline with a notable exception of the sciences where PhD and master holders have approximately the same earnings trajectories over the first five years. Next slide, please. This um, uh, continues on the work to look at the economic return of a PhD. This is defined as how much higher or lower earnings are for PhD graduates versus master's graduates. This is varying by gender and I'll speak uh, to each. We did exclude MBAs um, because uh, they are not uh, typically a pathway to uh, a PhD and it would have been distortive on the overall findings. Uh, we're only presenting the data here, not for the entire PhD population, but the population of graduates under 40. We have the entire data, of course, in the report. But if we look at the top chart, this is for men. And uh, the gray band is where the value, the economic return of the PhD is higher than the master's. The uh, red, it is lower. We analyzed three census. 2006, 2011, and 2016. Um, when you consider the opportunity costs, that is where earnings are foregone by choosing to continue to study for a PhD rather than entering the workforce after completing a, PhD, a master's. For men on the top, in 2006, if you look at where that yellow line crosses uh, from red over to gray, it took eight years to catch up to the earnings had they stopped at a master's. If you fast forward to 2016, the red line, then it had increased to 16 years for those who could have stopped at a master's degree. So that is suggesting and showing through data that the payoff, uh, it's taking longer to get that payoff for men than uh, it was through 2006. On the lower chart is for women and the dynamics are different. Uh, women with PhDs do not start their career earning less than they would have had they started the workforce directly after a master's. So it's not uh, for 2011 and 16 starting below in the red. Um, and so you can see the value for women doing PhDs over a master's uh, is there uh, in terms of economic return. However, PhD graduates we know are five years older entering the labor market and not forgetting uh, the overall earnings for women are lower than for men, regardless of degree. Next slide, please. In terms of academic culture, uh, we found it can support or hinder the transition of PhDs to the labor market. Um, we know the value of, of academic culture, which are sort of the norms and behaviors uh, within the academic environment. It can create a community for people with shared interests, enabling them to collaborate, to learn and develop a new, uh, new uh, ideas and to share ideas. However, there are aspects of this culture that can create challenges, particularly for those who do not want to stay in academia or who have felt that they have failed in a desired academic career. Uh, we know from the data that PhD students tend to experience a higher rate of depression and anxiety than the general population. And contributing to this higher incidence of mental health issues are a sense of uselessness and emotional burnout, tried, trying to balance the competing demands of work and personal life. Um, we know that um, particularly in the sciences uh, and some other STEM disciplines, um, the expectations of spending long time uh, in the lab, uh, that can contribute. Whereas in the humanities and social sciences, you have factors associated with isolation in, in your research and, and in writing. Uh, these mental health issues can extend beyond graduation, uh, creating additional challenges for PhDs as they transition to the workplace. So the whole concept of academic culture, which I'll touch on in promising programs, um, is very important because you have uh, some PhD students and graduates 
who are brought into an environment uh, feeling that success is an academic appointment, a tenure track. And if you do not achieve that, you have somehow failed. And that obviously causes a lot of stress into the system. And uh, these uh, PhD students and graduates uh, are bearing the brunt of, of that culture on the negative side. And again, as a quote on the next slide, um, I think this uh, sums up uh, some of certainly what we read and heard. The faculty being unhappy filtered down to us. They had the power to make us unhappy. We know in a PhD, the influence of uh, a PhD student uh, advisor is huge, um, guiding them towards academic success, but also shaping expectations and career ambitions. Many of our academics, they themselves have been trained um, within these environment and are either ill prepared or in some cases unwilling to help their students transition to non-academic careers, which may require either different skill sets or approaches in how that is framed uh, for other non-academic opportunities. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, extending this, PhD graduates may not be aware of the skills and abilities that they could bring to future employers, or there may be a mismatch between what they have and what employers um, are looking for. Um, they are uh, holding many jobs over their careers. They need transferable skills as well as the ability to learn new skills and ways of working. Um, PhD graduates have a very clear sense of their knowledge, but they often fail to recognize what skills they have, a so-called skills awareness gap. On the other hand, uh, the private sector recognizes that PhDs do have very highly specialized knowledge, but often see them as lacking adaptability and certain communication and teamwork skills. And perhaps even the ability to collaborate with diverse actors or to incorporate multiple perspectives that cross disciplinary and societal uh, sector boundaries would require. What's interesting uh, is that in Canada, we talk about the skills mismatch. We talk about the need for talent at the same time when we're talking about PhD graduates facing challenges entering the labor market. Next slide, please. And, and to sort of capture this uh, through this quote, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm good for. I don't know how to come to terms with the fact that I the life I imagined is not going to happen. And we know for many of these PhD students and graduates, it, comes, it can come very late in their program or even after they complete their studies that there's this realization that what they thought and what has been expected of them is not going to transpire. Next slide, please. In terms of um, seeking employment outside of Canada or international students coming into Canada, uh, this is a topic uh, certainly that we looked at. There is, are some data gaps, uh, I would suggest, uh, in this area. We know the proportion of PhD graduates from Canadian institutions who are international students is growing. It's a quarter of all PhD graduates in 2016. They are mobile, more mobile than domestic students. Um, they re re relocated to Canada for their studies and they have a tendency to be more mobile post-graduation um, because of their uh, coming from an international background, but also because many, a higher percentage come uh, from or study in the STEM fields. Uh, mobility is often seen as a requirement for PhDs to seek uh, positions in academia. Um, there's not a lot of data, as I mentioned, but what we did see through some of the surveys is that the primary motivations to move are the prestige of international institutions or researchers and the opportunity to maximize their chances in obtaining an academic position. Um, in terms of uh, Canadian PhDs graduates to leave Canada to look outside of academia, again from the surveys, it suggests that uh, they're leaving because of sufficiently uh, a number of high quality employment opportunities in uh, uh, Canada. And in most cases, um, they are moving to the United States. Next slide, please. Uh, 
a quote, although I would like to be employed in Canada, the science opportunities and the salaries in the US are much more reflective of the overall priority the US places in the value of science compared to the previous Canadian governments and industry. This is from a UBC tracking uh, survey that was done again from a graduate who left the country for a better job in the United States. So moving to the next slide, um, this is chapter seven, where we talk about promising practices and approaches. Very forward looking and really trying to capture some of the momentum that is happening within our institutions, be it academic institutions, government, and even with industry. And we separated these into four areas that I'll just touch on. One is to modernize the PhD program design and academic culture. Um, this is everything from look at alternative theses uh, from the traditional theses, perhaps into other um, aspects, whether it's uh, peer reviewed papers or, or, or other things that come together to form a thesis. But really, um, it's also looking at how can we be that much more student centered, not looking at what's good for the institution, the supervisor, how do we be very student centered. Um, and there are a number of initiatives. Um, I'll just point out the Public Scholars Initiative at UBC is one example. Uh, secondly, is to support supervisors to improve and expand mentorship for PhD students. So um, again, uh, trying to help uh, the supervisor who may not have that personal experience, um, really tackling this head on, having early conversations with PhD students about their career aspirations. Um, perhaps we've seen uh, programs where a student has two uh, supervisors, again, who can expose them to a broader um, supervisory capacity and experience and networks, uh, but really trying to uh, have those conversations earlier and to mentor the student, not just by the supervisor, but by, by the institution as well. Thirdly, our uh, transitional initiatives, um, looking at um, uh, really trying to increase the support to students and their graduates. Um, some of these are programs like the NSERC Create. Um, you've got things like the MyTax program, Work Integrated Learning, uh, a number of these that are uh, existed to really try to build the relationships between PhD students and graduates and potential employers. So employers can better understand the value of PhD graduates and what they can bring to the table and the PhDs themselves can understand what is expected of them and how they can frame their experience uh, to be that much more desirable uh, from, from the private sector as an example. And, and fourthly is looking at targeted programs uh, to increase demand amongst non-academic uh, employers. Um, again, we've seen in the federal government, they have programs to recruit uh, policy uh, leaders. Again, their ability to uh, look at PhDs, uh, to increase those numbers, looking at programs like the Creative Destruction Lab, uh, which is all about entrepreneurship. We see a number of PhDs uh, looking at taking their research and, and commercializing and actually building companies. So really uh, looking at ways that we can increase that receptor capacity outside of academia, which is going to be critical, uh, again, given uh, the need of Canada and the knowledge uh, intensive uh, industries and, and certainly the availability of high quality personnel. So in terms of um, reflections, the next slide, please. Um, we really want to, as a panel, highlight the importance of PhD graduates as a valuable uh, resource uh, to our country. Um, they're facing significant challenges as they enter the labor market. Um, they're having difficulties transitioning to this market. Uh, it's a growing concerns for the graduates, as well, of course, for universities, employers, funders, government, and the overall uh, public. Um, we felt uh, as a panel that we have and have a double duty of care. We talked a lot about this. First is the responsibility for the advancement of PhDs themselves, that they are passionate. They want to make a contribution. They have high expectations of themselves. Uh, we need to ensure that the programming and the investment that they are making and we are making in them um, will uh, be valued and can create value. 
Second duty of care is to Canada, to the advancement of society, economy, to our environment. Um, it's very important that, that we look at our PhDs as a resource for this country. Uh, as we grow our knowledge economy, as we talk about the skill shortage, as we need innovation, productivity, and creativity, uh, as Canada really uh, emerges uh, this century uh, as a leader, we need to look at our PhDs as that valuable resource and ensure that we are set up for success for the future. So I'm going to stop there and turn it back over to you, Eric, uh, for some uh, Q&A and dialogue. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, uh, Elizabeth. Um, judging by the volume of chats and uh, questions that we've got, I think it's fair to say there's considerable interest in what uh, the expert panel had to say and in the stimulating comments um, that your uh, presentation has raised. Um, we've got a, a top team working behind the scenes to try and capture as many of the questions that uh, people have been asking both on the chat and, uh, and in the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance, as I said before, that we won't be able to get to every single one of the questions. We're going to try and get through um, you know, as many as we can, as helpfully as we can, and obviously there'll be opportunities to, to follow up uh, later on. So Elizabeth, I think the easiest thing to do is to begin with sort of a, a question that I will take from the pile, ask you, uh, and then maybe allow you to give, uh, give your uh, remarks to it. Um, the first question is, there wasn't a mention of the need for PhD graduates in government, in uh, science, policy, finance, the departments of the, of the federal, or one may even suggest the provincial governments. Did the panel consider uh, the demand for PhDs in this sector in addition to the academic and industrial sectors? Um, well, as I noted in one of our slides, um, we, we did break down um, where PhD graduates go uh, as a sector. Um, and we, we lumped into the, what we call the public sector, which is approximately 10%. Um, and in promising programs, I did mention uh, there is a federal government program that looks to uh, bring on PhD graduates in terms of uh, policy areas. Um, given that this report was sponsored by the federal government, um, uh, we hope uh, as a panel and one would expect that as, as they look at this and, and absorb uh, our findings and, and reflect on perhaps areas where um, where improvements can be made, uh, certainly uh, within government um, would be sort of a, a natural extension of things that are being done now. Um, but um, a lower percentage of GERD is done, uh, obviously, within the government itself, but it is an important part of it. And I would uh, hope and expect uh, that uh, further opportunities for PhD graduates within the public sector more broadly, provincially, federally, uh, would be uh, under discussion. Thanks. Um, another question, and I'm we're sort of taking these in different uh, uh, different priorities. Try to cover as many of the different topics as possible. Um, obviously, in a, in a report of this um, uh, length, there is only so much that you can uh, look at. You already mentioned that there was a timing issue regarding uh, whether to address COVID nineteen issues, but just going to the data issue itself. Um, there's some interest, I think, that from our audience about the challenges that uh, your panel faced when putting the report together, uh, gaps that might have existed in the data that had it been there, it would have been useful. Um, maybe about the size, uh, the slide, excuse me, there's a slide on, on tenure track and Canadian versus international recruits. But the main issue is how to think about the gaps or the kind of evidence that um, may not have been available and, and did that affect the outcome of, uh, of the report itself? Thanks very much. Certainly, and I think one of the challenges when you, um, you know, for the expert panel is, is, you know, limiting the scope, obviously, to the charge, but also um, 
you know, to what is available. And there are a number of gaps, um, you know, just on the whole postdoctoral fellow side, I would say um, there's some gaps, um, even on PhDs, uh, you know, PhDs leaving Canada, coming back to Canada, that that's certainly a challenge. I would say, um, particularly there, there's lack of data on the EDI side, equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, from underrepresented groups. Uh, that was certainly a challenge uh, for us. We, as you noted, I talked about uh, gender, um, but didn't delve into uh, other underrepresented groups. And frankly, there's not a lot of data there. So I think um, that's a challenge. And just where do uh, PhDs, where are they employed specifically? How many are in transitional roles? The average length of time it takes to launch a career? you know, these are, are, are really important questions that there's not sort of explicit data that we could tackle and include in the report. So uh, all to say, I think it is ripe uh, for further research uh, and investigation. Thanks, and I, I can certainly say on behalf of CCA that any report that starts and ends, there will always be the question of, is there something else that could have been uh, said? And hopefully this is the beginning of the conversation on this topic, not, not the last word. I want to turn to a, a different kind of question again, this one more about interpersonal training, uh, career assistance, uh, supervisors, um, and really a question about whether you think of the kind of training and career assistance should be part of the training and job duty of a, of a PhD supervisor and, and graduate departments. What role does that play and did the, the committee talk about that? Um, absolutely. I, I think anyone who's done a PhD or been a supervisor, and, and as I mentioned, it's a very important relationship um, in terms of uh, establishing the, um, the environment that the PhD student is um, immersed in, setting up those career expectations. And um, absolutely, I think uh, training and uh, helping our supervisors be better mentors understanding some of this data that many of their graduates will not be like them going on to an academic career. And it is our shared responsibility to prepare these graduates for um, other more diverse employment opportunities is important. There are a number of programs, uh, again, that are in place that are, that are starting to do that. Um, some of them work with the individual supervisors. Some of them work at the institutional level that PhD graduates can uh, sort of take um, you know, workshops and other things. I think what's really important though is that this gets institutionalized, that it is sometimes um, you know, uh, faculty members as supervisors, they are not as supportive of their PhD uh, students in, uh, in taking up and, and making use of these programs that may exist. And uh, to me, this is a shared responsibility and uh, we need to, again, be student centric and make sure that we are developing programs, initiative and approaches uh, that are going to best serve the student and through the student, um, our, our country and society. Thanks uh, very much. Um, I want to pivot a little bit now. And again, thanks to all of you who are uh, putting questions or comments in the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the screen. We have, as I say, a, a team behind the scenes who are capturing them. And if you want to know what happens behind the screen, there's a Google document we're trying to keep uh, up go, uh, going through so we can, I can keep track of them. Um, this is a question really getting to the heart of some of the findings that you described, and maybe you can reflect a little bit more on them, Elizabeth. Th this relates to really whether and how we are training um, our uh, PhD graduates for uh, positions outside of, of academia right now. Um, is it about industry not recognizing the skills or the skills not being there? Are there um, disciplinary differences I realize you answered a question relating to uh, the role of PhDs in government science, and there are some others about that, but maybe to reflect on uh, positions outside of academia uh, generally and this skill uh, asynchrony. Well, I think all of your comments are certainly are valid, Eric, in terms of, um, it, you know, it's not one thing. Um, you know, if I look at the employer side, 
Um, you know, we, we had some interesting briefings from my tax, for example, who, who are exactly that is their program is to do matches between PhD students, graduates, postdocs and industry and um, you know, in many cases, it's industry not being aware of the, the total value proposition that a PhD student or graduate brings to the table. Um, sometimes the vernacular is different in terms of what they know or how they do things. Um, once they've experienced having a PhD on their, on their team as supported through a MyTax program, the light bulb comes on and it's like, wow, you know, this person can really add value uh, to our organization and uh, we want to keep them. Uh, part of it lies, I think, on the, the PhD uh, graduates themselves of, of, of the mental uh, framework around how do they take their knowledge and skills and put it in a, a rubric, if you will, that is going to be um, interesting, desirable for industry. Um, and in many cases, and we, we heard this through some of the stories that a PhD you know, student goes through their program, not even thinking, perhaps till very late in the game, that this academic career is not going to work out. And, and then it's a matter of, okay, now what do I do? And getting support to round out their knowledge, but reframing their knowledge and skills in a way that is going to position them better uh, to other employers uh, is key. Putting specific programs in place, and we've seen a number of them and talked about them in the report, you know, what is it working in teamwork? What is it working in a basic, uh, basic sort of functions within a company or an organization? Uh, communication skills, um, you know, all of the things that uh, perhaps somebody who gets a bachelor's degree hits at 21, uh, some of our PhD graduates aren't sort of experienced until their mid thirties. And so how do you take what you do have and reframe it? And then how do you add layers to what you have um, before you graduate or shortly after you graduate to add to your knowledge base and skill set. So it's it's both, I think. It's it's not, this is not a, you know, one side is doing it right and the other side just isn't figuring it out. It's it's really having those conversations and the linkages between this tremendous knowledge base and resource of our PhD graduates and their tremendous need, um, you know, within our private sector as an example to uh, innovate and to, to drive their companies forward. And so, uh, you know, again, I'll, I'll point to MyTax as one exemplar uh, of that, but there are others uh, out there as well that, that are really trying to uh, really pull down these silos uh, to better utilize our PhD graduates. I think it's a, it's, you've also alluded to something, um, not to put words in your mouth, but the, the demographic uh, and economic shifts in society clearly were uh, uppermost or, or if, if not uppermost, certainly on the mind of the, the panel where, I mean, I'm finishing reading the book, uh, The Hundred Year Life right now, others might have read it as well, looking at, you know, someone born today or in the last five or six years has a very good chance of living to a hundred, uh, which is sort of a phenomenal idea, which sort of changes the way you think about the old three siloed life of uh, education and, uh, and then knowledge application and then retirement. But I'm, I'm wondering whether you could maybe go one step further with that uh, question that we've just uh, asked and um, say a bit more about the various silos and whether they intersect. We've had a couple of questions now about industry. There was a question earlier about, about government. Um, would you like to say anything about the academic environment itself, lest we think that this is all a rush to find places other than the academy to work? Hardly. That's certainly not the, the main message of the of the uh, the report. But would you reflect both as a, a former president and as a as a scholar in your own right what the the future of the academy is with respect to uh, its own best practices? Are there universities, you don't have to name them, but are there places who seem to be doing it well? Are there examples of leading practices in the on the academy side? Well, you know, it's a great question, Eric, and, and one that the um, expert panel discussed quite a bit because all of these programs, um, you know, that I mentioned and are talked about in the report, and I'll come back to those, to try to um, have our PhD students and graduates uh, having more opportunities to be better utilized in terms of the resource uh, outside of academia. 
Um, those have benefit inside academia as well. Um, you know, better teamwork, better communication, um, you know, better project management. And I can say that as a university president, uh, former university president, those are all beneficial uh, to the, the academic environment. And, you know, what I hope, and, and certainly we discussed around the, the panel uh, in the context of academic culture, that it continually evolves, that the responsibility that a supervisor sees uh, their duty to their PhD students, their role um, in assisting that uh, PhD who is investing their time and energy in a significant part of their productive life in their studies, the supervisor really should be uh, improving their ability to support the students. And I think, you know, we're going to start, we're see, starting to see it shift some of those expectations uh, changing within our uh, academic um, uh, institutions with respect to supervisory duties, uh, assessing the quality of supervision uh, of, our, um, of our faculty, recognizing those who are doing it well, um, because the, the academy itself has to change. And you know, I think uh, as part of the sponsors, uh, obviously it's the federal government, but that inc is inclusive of the funding agencies, the Tri-Council, and I know they're very strongly interested in these findings because it's it's part of an ecosystem. You know, the funding agencies um, support and uh, in some cases um, really validate that academic culture um, through their committees and who's comprised in those committees. So we all have to work together to see how we can best support our PhDs whether they're going into the academy or whether they are um, looking at opportunities outside. There's lots of great examples. I mean, uh, you know, some of them uh, we touched on in the report, um, you know, at UBC, there's some great examples. Um, we have the, the wonderful work that's happening uh, through uh, McGill in, in some of their programs, but some of the research they're doing in the humanities. Um, that is so important because sometimes this is more obvious, uh, to lack of a better word, in the STEM disciplines, uh, but when you have the humanities as a discipline coming to the table and saying, okay, what are we doing and how do we do this differently to support our PhD graduates, that opens up the conversation and starts to change the academic culture. And it's when, you know, from the top, uh, sitting at the top of the institution, you can only do so much. It has to start from within. It has to start at ground level. And that's what we hope this report uh, does. Again, super. I realize it was a, a broad question, but I think better to ask the broad question and give you uh, room to uh, to roam on it. I'm going to take a, uh, another one that sort of uh, shifts us not uh, from out the inside of the country outside. We know that uh, you did have a, a consideration of, of the international uh, perspective uh, on this. And I wonder if you can comment on, on how Canada is or is not different from other countries in terms of the challenges of the PhDs transitioning uh, into the labor market. I, I realize this is a, a much larger topic than what uh, this panel undertook. I can certainly remind the audience that CCA has undertaken a number of assessments that looks at Canada's competitiveness internationally with respect to science and technology and STEM and where we are with, uh, uh, with our capacity to produce scholarship and the like. But just wondering maybe, Elizabeth, if you can reflect on other countries, uh, Australia comes to mind, but certainly uh, our friends in the UK, I think are uh, watching this, uh, this presentation. Lessons learned from other places, how Canada compares Maybe just give us a flavor of the international dimension to this topic. Well, I think uh, part of it starts is how is Canada different? And as I mentioned in the presentation, um, if you look at things like our GERD as a percentage of GDP, uh, you know, we are not just lagging the US significantly, we're lagging the average of the OECD and we're declining. So that that is a bigger conversation than um, just PhD graduates, but it certainly pulls in and supports some of the dynamics that we're seeing. Um, and, and also sort of within that, where is the R&D being conducted? And we know it's more heavily weighted to universities uh, than it is to the private sector uh, relative to other jurisdictions as well. So we, 
we have more work to do uh, than some other countries that are, um, you know, certainly uh, been more adaptive. I think, you know, some of the quotes that uh, we mentioned in the presentation, the US is a huge pull for PhD graduates from almost every other country, not just Canada, because of the ecosystem and the, the value uh, that is placed on a PhD within that environment. And, you know, we've, we've seen some interesting work coming out of Australia where um, part of the challenge is uh, many jobs, uh, they may be advertised, they don't say we need a PhD. Um, so how do you match if somebody has a PhD, uh, how can that person understand if they're even sort of qualified or could be a contributor to that role? So there's some work that's happening in Australia, a pilot to to sort of look at job advertisement and say, yes, this, this would be appropriate for a PhD. It's helpful for the company, but it's helpful for the PhD because that's, I think, one of our challenges here uh, as well uh, of being able to, to look at that. So um, we didn't do an extensive look um, at other countries. We have some examples, for example, out of Edinburgh University um, in the UK, looking at new supervision models and having two supervisors, things like that. But uh, to me, um, you know, I've even had since we've released reports and chats with people outside the country, a huge uh, amount of uh, interest uh, in this report, because I think everybody's feeling it to certain degrees. Uh, Canada just has some very specific um, uh, aspects to its economy uh, and to particularly its research enterprise that is going to make it even more challenging for us. Well, thank you for that answer. And uh, sadly, that's going to have to be the, the last one. We've actually got a few minutes over, which we understand is a good sign because uh, there's a lot of interest online. Elizabeth, I want to thank you for uh, providing the overview of this panel's report. I again want to thank uh, CAGS for its uh, partnering with us. I'm sure there's going to be more work that we'll do together. There'll be follow up and next steps. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for the opportunity. I'm going to turn it back over to uh, to Ian. Ian, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Eric, and to Dr. Cannon. Uh, what a wonderful presentation. The chat uh, menu is absolutely filled with comments and engagement, and the questions I see have reached 45. So this is an incredible session. I think we could have gone for two or three hours, uh, but unfortunately, our next session is coming up. So I will pass things over to Marty for her final words of thanks. Good. Thank you, Ian. Well, first, um, Huge thanks to Elizabeth for a fabulous presentation, to Eric for hosting this event today, and also to the expert panel that put it all together. I found myself nodding away by myself here at my desk to almost everything that was said. And I also liked the whole angle that the report took, which was not about cutting the number of PhDs, but finding places for them all to land and be successful. And I think we all have some work to do, just like you said. It'll come from all sectors, uh, but we'll get there. I found it really inspiring. So thank you so much. And uh, thanks to all of the audience who joined us today. Really hope you got the same thing out of it I did, which I'm sure you did. So thank you, take care. And um, for those who are at the CAGS conference, you can have a few minutes to catch the 3MT video before we move to our next session. See you later. <laughs>